Now let's go back to our big picture. After mean hashing, which is here, we're able to compress long vectors into short vectors so that they can fit into the main memory. However, if we have a very large number of documents, say 1 million, comparing every pair of them can still take a very, very long time. And this is why we need locality sensitive hashing to focus only on the pairs of signatures that are likely to be from similar documents. Recall that our goal is to find documents with jacquard similarity at least as, for example, we can set this similarity threshold to 0 0.8. And the general idea of LSH is to use a function f of x and y that tells whether or not x and y is a candidate pair. Note that this is not final yet, this is only a candidate. So we still have to go back to every candidate pair to evaluate them. And if we start from the min hash matrices, we will first hash the columns of the matrix to many buckets. And each pair of the documents that are hashes to the same bucket will be called a candidate pair. Concretely, we will first pick a similarity threshold S, and this S will be larger than zero and smaller than one. And the columns X and Y, basically that's document X and Y, column X and Y of M are a candidate pair if their signatures agree on at least fraction S of their rows. For example, let's say that we have this small signature matrix of four documents, so that's four columns, and let's set the S which is the similarity threshold to 0 0.6. And we'll go back to look at column one and column two. We can see that only row one and row three are the same. And that means that similarity will be above 0 0.6. And that means they are a candidate pair. And we expect the documents X and Y to have the same jacquard similarity as their signatures recall the proof of the of the min hash right therefore we can say that the jacquard similarity of these documents will be above 0 0.6 so the big idea of lsh for min hash is to hash columns of the signature matrix several times and we expect that similar columns are likely to hash to the same bucket with high probability and the candidates are those that are hashed to the same bucket. For example, let's go back to this small signature matrix. We set the threshold to 0 0.6. And for the first hash function, these two, these two columns will be hashed into the same bucket. And since they're similar, they're actually candidate pairs. So most probably, if we have a second hash function, they will also be hashed into, into the same bucket. And in practice, we often partition this signature matrix M into B bands. And each band we say that it will have R rows. And we will treat each band of one row as a signature and we will use a hash function to hash it into some bucket. So to write them down more clearly, we'll first divide the matrix M into B bands of R rows. And for each band, we will hash its portion of each column to a hash table with k buckets. And you might want to make this k as large as possible because you will want to avoid collision of the hash, hash function. And the candidate column pairs are those that are hashed to the same bucket for at least one band. So as long as in one of the band, as long as in one of the band that hash into the same bucket, they, they will be called candidate pairs. And we can also tune the B and R, which are basically, you can call it hyperparameters, to catch most similar pairs, but few non-similar pairs. So basically we want to tune B and R to, to a point that we can get a ideal number of false positive and an ideal number of uh, false negative. For example, let's say that we have this large signature matrix M, and let's say that we have seven documents, so we have seven columns here, and each band, let's say that we can look at this band, and each column in this band will be 
will be hashed into a different bucket as we can see. And more concretely, if we look at column two and column six, we can see that they're actually hashed into the same bucket. So they are definitely candidate pair. And in contrast, if we look at column six and column seven, they are not hashed into the same bucket. They are, they are going to a different bucket. That means they may not be a candidate pair. But note that if in a different band, let's say here, if in a different band, these two columns, six and seven, if they're hashed into the same bucket, they can still be a candidate pair. And next, let's start to analyze LSH. And to do this, let's first make a simplifying assumption saying that there are enough buckets so that columns are unlikely to hash the same bucket unless they are identical in a particular band. That basically assumes that there will be no collision for each hash function. So we're assuming that the same bucket means identical in that band. Note that this assumption is need only to simplify the analysis, but this is not for the correctness of the algorithm. And let's analyze this LSH using this example. We assume the following case. Suppose we have 100K documents, that's 100K columns in this large matrix M. And let's say that each signature of the columns consists of 100 integers. So basically we will have 100 rows for these, for these matrix. And we can see that this whole signature matrix, actually it only takes 40 megabytes of the space. So it, it can be easily fit into the band memory. And we choose B to be 20. So we have 20 bands and we choose R to be five. So basically we will have five rows per band and the goal is to find pairs of document that are at least 0 0.8 similar. Let's say that C1 and C2 are 80% similar. And since the similarity is above the threshold, which is 0 0.8, we will want these two documents to be a candidate pair. So basically we want them to hash to at least one common bucket. And that means at least one band will be identical. And what's the probability of this happening? the probability of this happening will be about 99%. This is actually a very good number. And next, we will go through it step-by-step step to see how we get to this number. First, the probability of C1 and C2 identical in one particular band is 0 0.8 raised to a power of five, which is about 0 0.3. Why is this? This is because the probability that one row is identical is 0 0.8. And we have five rows in one band, therefore we get the number of 0 0.8 raised to the power of five. And the probability that C1 and C2 are not similar in all of the 20 bands would be one minus this number raised to the power of 20, which is very small. And how do we get this equation? This is because the probability that C1 and C2 are not identical in one particular band would be one minus this number. Therefore, since we have 20 bands, the probability that they are not similar in all of the 20 bands would be this number raised to the power of 20. So basically about one in every 3000 of the 80% similar column pairs are false negative. And false negative here means that they're actually similar items, uh, they're actually similar pairs, but we kind of miss them and classify them as negative. But still we, in this, in this whole process, we will find more than 99% of the pairs of truly similar documents. And this is quite impressive. Now let's look at another example. Let's assume that C1 and C2 are only 30% similar. Since this is actually well below the threshold, we want C1 and C2 to hash to no common buckets. So all bands should be different. So what's the probability of this? Let's go through it step by step. The probability that C1 and C2 are identical in one particular band is 0 0.3 raised to the power of five, which is actually very small. And the probability that C1 and C2 
are identical in at least one band of these 20 bands would be one minus the difference between one and 0.00243 raised to the power of 20, which is about 4%. Why do we get this equation? This is because the probability that C1 and C2 are not identical in one particular band is actually one minus this number. Therefore, the probability that C1 and C2 are not identical in all of the 20 bands would be this difference raised to the power of 20. Therefore, finally, the probability that these two documents are identical in at least one band would be one minus this. So in, in other words, approximately 4% pairs of the documents with similarity 0 0.3 will end up becoming candidate pairs. And these are false positive since we will have to examine them. But then it will turn out that their, similar, their similarity is below the threshold S. You may have noticed until now that LSH actually involves a trade-off. We have several we have several parameters to choose, right? We have uh, the option to choose M, which is the number of mean hash, and this is also the rows of the matrix M, and we can also choose the number of bands, which is B, and we can also choose the number of rows per band, which is R here. We can choose this number to balance the number of false positives and false negatives. And note that we have an additional constraint here, which is B times R should be equal to M. For example, if we have only 15 bands of five rows, as opposed to 20 bands, then the number of false positive will go down from 4% to 3%. This is good, right? But the number of false negative will actually go up from 0 0.00035 to 0.00257. And if we look at this figure here, um, the horizontal axis would be T, which is the similarity of C1 and C2. And the vertical axis would be the probability of C1 and C2 sharing a bucket. And ideally, what we want is that if the similarity is below the threshold, then we want them to be have no choice, no choice, no chance that C1 and C2 will share a bucket. And if T is larger than S, we want the probability that they share a bucket to be one. So basically what we want is a step function here. And what one band of one row gives you will be a straight line. This is because the probability of equal hash values will be identical to the jacquard similarity of two documents. Remember our little statement in the mean hash, right? And what B bands of R rows gives you, where B and R are equal to one, would be something like this. For example, let's say that um, we have B bands of R rows, and the probability that all rows of a band are equal would be T raised to the power of R, because we have R rows, right? And more concretely, we will look at these two documents where we have three bands of two rows, then the probability that all rows of this band are equal would be t raised to the power of two. So it's basically t squared. And the probability that some row of a band is unequal is one minus this term. So this, this is basically the probability that one band is not identical. So the probability that no bands are identical will be this number raised to the power of B, since we have B bands, right? And the, finally, the probability that at least one band is identical will be one minus this whole term. Therefore, the probability that they are hashed to the same bucket will be this. To write them down more clearly, let's say that columns C1 and C2 have similarity T, 
and we pick any band of R rows, then the probability of all rows in this band are equal would be T to the power of R. Then the probability that some row in this band are unequal will be one minus that. Therefore, the probability that no bands are equal would be this number raised to the number, uh, raised to the power of B, since we have B bands. And finally, the probability that at least one band is identical would be one minus that. Let's look at an example. Let's say that we have some similarity thresholds S and B equals to 20 and R equals to five. Then the probability that at least one band is identical for different T looks like this. We can see that in the middle, the function actually is very steep, but in both ends, they're pretty slow. So basically it will look like this graphically. And you can see that we can actually pick different R and B to get the best S shape here. And let's say that we have uh, 50 hash functions with R equals to five and B equals to 10. And we will get a S curve that looks like this. And the area in here, which is the green area will be actually equal to the false positive rate. And the blue area will be equal to the false negative rate. And to summarize LSH, we have three steps. Uh, first, we can tune M, B, e, and R to get almost all pairs with similar signatures, but eliminate most pairs that do not have similar signatures. And the second step would, of course, be to check in memory that the candidate pairs really do have similar signatures. And optionally, you can have the first step where in another pass through the raw data, and by raw data, I mean the data before the main hash, which is very high dimensional. And we, would, we will check that the remaining candidate pair really represent a similar document. Why do we need to do this? If we remember that in our previous small example, the Jakar similarity is actually not exactly the same as the signature similarity. Therefore, it will be good to go back to check the raw document, All right? And to summarize the whole lecture, we have learned three steps to find similar documents. The first step would be shingling, which is to convert documents to sets. And we use hashing to assign each single an ID. And the second step will be min hash, which is to convert large sets to short signatures while preserving similarity. We do this so that the signature matrix can be fit into the main memory. And we use similar preserving hashing, which is main hash, to generate signatures with the following property. And the property is that the hash values of column one and column two, if the probability that they be in identical is equal to the Jakar similarity of C1 and C2. And we will use hashing to generate the random permutation. This is the row hashing that we mentioned before. And in the first step, we will do LSH, which is to focus on only the pairs of signature likely to be from similar documents. So we focus on only pairs in the same buckets. And we'll use hashing to find candidate pairs of similarity larger than or equal to S.